right, we're going to venture into learning. A lot of you think of learning, you're thinking of sitting in school, taking your notes, studying and all that. But you know what? You're learning something all the time, every day. Things that you're not even aware that you're learning. Think about it. You know, why do you hold the pencil the way you do? Um, how do you, why do you behave in certain situations you do? A lot of it has to do with experience and the kind of concepts we're going to look at. Daisy's back there showing off some of her favorite tricks that she's learned with some of these concepts. Okay, so we're going to delve into learning coming up right now. So we begin with learning. Okay, here are the objectives. Have a look, make sure you know what we're, what we're trying to find out here. Okay, so we're gonna start out, uh, what is learning? Okay, learning is basically a change in behavior uh, that is basically enduring and lasts for a while. Habituation is the idea that once we're exposed to something long enough, we tend to lose interest in it. Okay, so this can happen with a stimulus that we have um, or anything else, and you'll understand more when we look at the concepts that we're going to look at. Okay, stimulus. Okay, stimulus response. A stimulus is something that causes a response. So, exam for example, you put your fingers on a hot light bulb, you pull them away. The light bulb, the hot light bulb is a stimulus. Your movement, pulling it away is a reaction or the response. Okay, and that's the stimulus response relationship. We're going to first look at associative learning. Associative learning is when we start to associate events that happen one after the other. Okay, and in this case, it's mostly classical conditioning and operant conditioning. We will look at cognitive learning and observational learning in a future video. So one of the ones we look at is called classical conditioning, and this is where it's normally responses that we naturally have, and we start to learn a an association. For example, when we see lightning, we expect thunder, and we wince. However, sometimes we may just see the lightning and we wince in anticipation of the thunder. Operant condition is different. When, this is when we do something, we like operate on our environment, and the result that happens will dictate whether we are going to do that behavior again or we're not going to do it again. Okay, so we'll look a little more closely. First of all, classical conditioning. Ivan Pavlov is the guy. He was actually a physicist, and he was... Um, studying the digestive tract in, in dogs. You may have heard of Pavlov's dog. Um, and what he found is he would feed the dogs and naturally these dogs would salivate. And he had a apparatus attached to the dog's cheek that would, the saliva would be diverted into the test tube so he could measure how much saliva was there was. But he also noticed, you know, like just the sight of food sometimes would make him salivate. My footsteps will make him salivate. Okay, so he continued on further to do some experiments um, using an experimental method, which we'll look at, to study the idea of classical conditioning. John B. Watson is somebody that followed up on this, and we've talked about John B. Watson in class before in his colorful past, um, how he came up with the term coffee break, which was ingenious because now we associate a stimulating drink, uh, caffeine is a stimulant, and we actually associate it with being relaxed, okay? And their school of thought was behaviorism, which was a, a major school of thought for a while. They said, you know, uh, we can't really call psychology a science if we're looking at things we can't see. So behaviors are things we can see that a person does and we can study them. So they thought that's what psychology should be. And that's what it was for a 50 year period, approximately. So his experimental procedure was looking at, well, now these he got diverted with this tension by the dogs salivating, you know, at, at the sound of footsteps and everything else. So he set up an, an apparatus, as you can see, where the dog has a test tube attached to his cheek, his salivary gland, so you can see how much salivates. And in this contraption that he has, he was able to, you know, administer different tones. Uh, and different sounds to see if those would be associated with food and the dog would salivate at those. So the way it works and some of the, the terms that you have, um, they can be difficult, uh, especially when we use abbreviations. So if you're writing a test or something, I suggest you write it down. First of all, if we think of conditioned, meaning learned, okay, if something is unconditioned, it means it's not learned. Okay, so in this case, we have food and a dog. Dogs salivate when food is presented or they eat food. Okay, so 
food is an unconditioned stimulus. The dog did not have to learn this. The response is salivation. Again, he didn't have to learn it. So it's an unconditioned response. Now, a neutral stimulus, and in this case is a tone. Surprisingly enough, Pavlov never used the bell, even though it's kind of famous when we think about, you know, uh, oh, Pavlov, Pavlov uh, that rings a bell. Well, it doesn't. It was used tones and, and other sounds, okay, so, and lights. So use a tone like from a tuning fork. And this is a neutral stimulus because you can go up to a dog and sound that tone and a dog is not going to salivate. That's not what they normally do. Okay, so it's neutral. It doesn't do anything. But when you pair the neutral stimulus right before the unconditioned uncon stimulus, and we're looking at probably the ultimate amount of time is about 0.5 seconds, half a second between the neutral stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus to actually have acquisition happening and conditioning occur. And in this case, the dog is still an unconditioned response because the food is here. However, after several trials of this, you'll find the dog starts to salivate to the tone. So the neutral stimulus now becomes the conditioned stimulus. He learned to salivate it. Notice the conditioned response is same as the unconditioned response. One of the concepts though is the conditioned response is never as powerful as the unconditioned response. And the neutral tone becomes the conditioned stimulus. Okay, uh, other examples, you know, physiological things can be classically conditioned. For example, perhaps you're out with your honey. Okay, and when you have a kiss, you have romantic arousal. Okay, but maybe you've, your honey's eaten this uh, strong onion sandwich. And then they give you a kiss. So the onion breath that they have is a neutral stimulus. It does not make you romantically aroused. Okay, but the, you throw the kiss in there. And if that's paired enough and acquisition takes place, that conditioned stimulus now becomes an onion, which can, which elicits the conditioned response, which is romantic arousal. Kind of weird, but you think of all those weird, you know, fetishes you hear, and this may explain a lot of them. And a lot of these are innocently occurred, but, you know, you're going to think of times in your life when, you know, not necessarily this, but where you're going to be conditioned unknown to you. TV commercials and stuff like that, often, you know, beer commercials will, will pair um, really good looking people having a lot of fun, which is physiologically stimulating, and they pair it with a beer logo. So when you go to the store to buy beer, when you're old enough, by the way, when you go there, you see that symbol, and it actually acts as a conditioned stimulus and causes that response, that physiological response, and you buy the beer, and you didn't even think the ad affected you, but it was very effective. So again, acquisition is the term we use for when this conditioning takes place. Higher order conditioning is, say for example, uh, the dog will now salivate to a tone. Well, if we pair another stimulus, maybe a light before the tone, the dog can become conditioned to salivate at the tone, or sorry, at the light instead of the tone. So it's like a second level of conditioning, and we call this higher order conditioning. A couple of other concepts that you need to be aware of. Extinction. With classical conditioning, extinction occurs after acquisition and the person has or the animal has been conditioned. Um, over time, you'll find uh, that often the unconditioned stimulus is, is there without the neutral stimulus. It's not paired together very often and eventually the effect goes away. However, after a period of time, uh, you may not have any response to the what was the neutral stimulus is now the conditioned stimulus. But just out of the blue, spontaneously, the conditioning recovers. And that's what we call spontaneous recovery. And it shows up, which actually shows us that the conditioning has left some kind of an imprint on your brain. Generalization is a concept that you may, for example, the dog may have been conditioned to salivate at a tone. Well, maybe a bell rings and that will condition or that will work as the tone as well. So it's generalizing that stimulus to other, other stimulus. Okay, so generalization is that idea. The little Albert experiment, which we'll be talking about later, little Albert was conditioned to be afraid of uh, a white rat that he was fond of previously. Um, however, after that, he was afraid of anything white and furry, Santa Claus's beard, white fur coats. That's generalization. 
discrimination is the opposite. So the dog will salivate at a tone, but he doesn't salivate at the bell. So he discriminates between those two, um, two stimuluses. So speaking of baby Albert, here's a little depiction of what it was. And I kind of explained what happened. It was Rosalie Trainer and John B. Watson that did this famous experiment. And what they would do is they presented little Albert with a bunch of animals. And he was particularly fond of a white rat. But what they would do is every time they presented the white rat, they would hit a loud gong that would scare the baby. Um, that is an unconditioned stimulus to invoke the fear response. But then what happened is little Albert became afraid of the white rat. So he would cringe and cry and try to get away from the white rat. Thing is, nobody really knows what happened to baby Albert. Um, he was left through this experiment, which is kind of unethical. He would have had to have been counter conditioned today. Um, and really, instill instilling fear in babies is probably not ethically sound anymore. But John Watson is very well known for this experiment. Very famous one. Now, operant condition is different. Okay, these are the outcomes. Again, have a look at them. So what this is, is based on a thing called Thorndike's Law of Effect, which basically says if you do something and you like whatever happens after it, you're more likely to do that action again or that behavior. So classical conditioning is a respondent behavior. You respond. Only things that can be classically conditioned are naturally occurring reflexes or responses that you have. Operant conditioning, we can condition an array of other things that the animal is capable of, basically anything, but some things are easier to condition than others. So it's associated with the consequence. If the animal does one behavior or the person and gets a favorable um, consequence from that, they're likely to do it again. If it's an unfavorable consequence, they're likely to not do it again. So Thorndike's law of effect again uh, is on this thing. I'll put the definition up here. Um, B.F. Skinner is really well known for this. Uh, he created a Skinner box or an operant chamber uh, is also what it's called. And it, it looks like this. Okay, so it's, got, it's a place where they can control the rat's environment or pigeon or whatever animal you use. And they have several apparatus that they can use to see if they can condition the animal. So in this case, it's a bar. And often what we, we, they would do is reinforce. Reinforce means specifically to strengthen or increase a behavior. So anything that strengthens or increases a behavior is reinforcement. Um, so for example, just maybe the bar pressing. When the rat presses a bar, food is released in the food dispenser and the rat eats it. And then he learns that when I push this bar, I get a good response. So he's more likely to push the bar again. And in fact, you can get a steady state response from the reinforcement. Shaping is looking at successive approximations of the behavior. So when you first put the rat in the operant chamber, he's going to look around. And so maybe just facing the lever, we're going to reinforce that by giving him a pellet of food. Uh, then maybe the next step, once he's got that, is we're going to shape his behavior by sniffing the lever. Um, then maybe we, the next step of reinforcement, we won't reinforce sniffing a lever, but we'll wait till he actually accidentally touches it with his paw. And then once he's done that, then he has to actually push on the lever to be reinforced. So we reinforce a series of behaviors that leads to the target behavior. So when we look at reinforcement, now the words positive and negative are used. Don't think of them as being good and bad. It, positive means added. Negative means taken away. So if we do something that increases behavior, immediately it's reinforcement. Okay, so a positive reinforcement is we add something. So your dog comes to you, so you pet your dog. Okay, when it comes when you call it. So it's more likely to do it again. Or we pay somebody to do a job. In this case, we're talking about paying a person who paints your house. You know, you think of it. You go to your job, those of you that have a job. Would you go if you weren't paid? being paid makes you go there. Negative reinforcement means negative again, taking away something that strengthens a behavior. Um, you ever wonder, you know, many of you probably take um, a pain reliever like Tylenol or aspirin for a headache. Why do you do that? Because the headache goes away. You've removed an adverse stimulus, which so makes you more likely to take the aspirin. Okay. Uh, or when you get in your car and the as soon as you get in and you close the door and turn it on, it makes that horrible beeping sound and there's a light, you want to get rid of it. So you put your seatbelt on right away. 
okay? And it gets rid of that aversive stimulus, okay? So that's positive reinforcement, adding something that strengthens behavior, negative reinforcement, taking away something that strengthens a behavior. Types of reinforcers can be several things. Primary reinforcers are all those things that are naturally reinforcing to people. For example, food is naturally reinforcing, drink, um, sex, all those kinds of things that are naturally reinforcing to somebody are the primary ones. Conditioned reinforcers are those things we've learned that may represent those primary reinforcers too. For example, money. You know, we'll take money. Money itself is not a the end all. It's the buying power that's actually the reinforcer. Okay, the ability to get things. Okay, um, now we can have immediate versus delayed reinforcers. The immediate reinforcers are more reinforcing than a delayed one. And in fact, delayed ones can add to things like superstitious behavior. If you've done the behavior and there's a time period that passes and you reinforce for it, they may be reinforcing the wrong behavior, which leads to lots of superstitious kinds of ideas. Many of you that are athletes probably know, like baseball players or hockey players or football or whatever, you know, it's things like you put your sock on differently one day and you had a good game. So now you got to put your sock on that way all the time. That's just one example. I'm sure you can come up with many that you've experienced. Um, as far as immediate being re more reinforcing, you think, um, should I study for my test that's in a few days? Or should I go out with my friends tonight or watch my favorite television show? Going out with your friends or watching your telev television show reinforces you immediately. So you're more likely to do that but you got to self-talk yourself out of that because you should be home studying psychology. Okay. And we're going to leave that right there for the first video. Okay. And we'll come back later with more types of learning. See you guys in class. Bye for now.